good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back. It's another Red Pill Religion podcast. We are moving to a non-live format for, for, for the time being, but the show goes on as always. Please make sure to find us not just on YouTube, but on BitChute and on Elbry, L-B-R-Y, and we're looking to be moving to other platforms. Please also find us on MeWe app, which we are moving towards as our primary fundraising vehicle. They seem to be very ethical. They're located down there in Australia. Um, in any case, uh, we will be accepting comments on the blog, where we have gone ahead and activated. Um, where we've gone ahead and activated discuss. We are not accepting comments on most of YouTube anymore. It's a, it's accessible and a waste of time and just an excuse to get you banned. So if you want to comment on one of our shows, come off of YouTube, come hit us on redpillreligion.com or find us on on me we lab. And we'd be happy to hear from you there. By the way, redpillreligion.com is where you'll always find us, even if we disappear from another social media platform, lose another YouTube channel, whatever's going on. We, if you like the kind of content we're doing, we're continuing onward, we're pressing onward in these weird times. Uh, if you want to sh show us some love in the PayPal donation job or, or subscribe star or me, we app, we're happy to hear from you. Buying some of our merchandise is also appreciated. Uh, also, uh, so in any case, but while we're still on YouTube or any other service, please give us a like and a subscribe. Definitely find us on BitChute, by the way. I'm trying to build that. Now, as is usual, we have on a Wednesday night, we have our uh, lawyer, raconteur, journalist, uh, science fiction writer, and overall Catholic nerd, John C. Wright. Say hello to the people and Mr. Wright. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And please, everybody, be sure to visit scifiright.com, where you will find a uh, the latest offerings, including, as is usual on Wednesdays, the latest episode Episode chapter, whatever we want to call it, of Lost on the Last Continent, episode 89, Ever Defiant of Entropy. This is good sample fiction to see uh, John's work. What's happening in chapter 89, sir? In chapter 89, Colonel Lost, longing for his true love, and Captain Grind, longing for fratricide, set off in hopeless pursuit of the swifter, larger air fleet of the Watchers. It says so right there in black and white. All right, there you go. And there's only there is only uh, uh, 16 episodes left, and only. so sometime later this year, Lost in Lost Continent, which is which I've been running for two years now, is going to come to a a, a thrilling climax. And uh, I, I'm not going to tell you whether or not I'm going to destroy the entire planet or not. That's you'll just have to read and find out. Well, then what you could do is go ahead and collect it in a book and uh, publish it for easy reading for those uh, who don't want to read it for free uh, on on the blog. So that's pretty I, cool. I do that. I do that for all the works that I that I put forward as free samples. They're all also available commercially. Excellent. So, if, speaking of which, available commercially, be sure to click on the works link when you get there, and you can see all of the professional fiction, including much of it award-winning, award-nominated, uh, uh, well-reviewed, and well-liked, and uh, buy some buy some of his books. It's good if you buy books from John C. Wright. So, oh, and also visit ljanjilamplater.com and uh, see her work, too. That is Mrs. Wright. So, tonight, John, since we're going, to, we've also been, John and I have been uh, uh, agreeing that we need to slow down and interrupt each other less. So, one of the things we're probably going to do is slow down a little bit. Um, let me turn off the uh screen sharing here and we're going to talk about the subject of mary and i think as my my title i did have i did make up a title screen for this and and i forgot to show it so maybe i should go ahead and show it now turn the screen sharing back on um and this is one of the things we would say mary phobia divides christians not just catholics from protestants but rather some protestants from all others so the question would be where it comes from. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. I know, you know, some of our readers, some of our fans are like, why are you talking about this specific topic? Well, there's several topics. There's several reasons, because we do still talk about politics and we talk about other religions. We talk about other religions in respectful tones. Um, we try to. But I got to tell you, John, as, as a, a Christian who essentially feels that he came in through the Mary path, or as some Catholics say, the, the Mary window, it is really hard for me to get along with Christians who are contemptuous of, of, of Our Lady, which is what Catholics call her. 
Uh, but and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you comment. But I keep emphasizing this, and it's like they can't hear us. So like they can't hear me when I say this. Let's say. I mean, I want everybody to be Catholic, but uh, if you're not going to be Catholic with me, I, I mean, I've got friends who are not Catholic, lots and lots of them, actually. Most of them are Orthodox, but still. Um, Protestants of various denominations like Methodists and some Evangelicals are uh, at least friendly and non-hostile to this stuff. Some Quakers I've met, you know, I, I've met any number of Protestants who are not actively anti mary They might think we're wrong. Or they might think be curious, but they 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 have no hostility for it. Yet you encounter this raging hostility from some, and I imagine you've encountered it too. It's it's like almost as bad, maybe even worse than the hostility atheists have for Christians. Do you know what I mean? I haven't encountered it uh, very much. I've only encountered like one or two uh, uh, people who seem to have any rational hatred of Mary. But I am aware of it, and I certainly in, in history it was a lot. It was a lot worse. Most Americans tend to be a little polite about other people's religion because we live in a kind of a live and let live society. But uh, it's it's clear that there is a there's a, a, a true hatred of Mary that runs back through the the German and the English uh, traditions. Uh, it's obvious. And if, if you want me not to interrupt, you have to not switch topics. You have to say one thing and then stop because on your previous comment, the reason why Catholics get so provoked about this issue is because we regard Mary as the mother of Jesus, as all Christians should. And so if someone's insulting your mother, you're, you're, not only do you have the chivalrous impulse of a man who wants to defend the honor of his lady, you also have the impulse of a loyal son who wants to de defend his mother. And since the uh, since the hatred has no justification in Christian tradition or, or religion, uh, it, it is about the most provocative thing you could imagine to do to if you want if you wanted to get someone's goat, if you wanted to push the buttons, is insult insult the mother of his God. I have some I have some uh, theories as to where. It all ultimately comes from and what path it went through, but it would probably be too contentious. And and people with this anti-Marian attitude, and I, I have run into it more than once, um, it usually comes out of some variety of Calvinist. Now, I don't hate all Calvinists. I, I grew up Calvinist, and, and you know there are some good people there. Um, and, and they're not all like this, but usually some out of the orbit of thing, people like Alpha and Omega Ministries and James White and that crew. I, I mean, I even had an encounter only a few days ago in an, in an online chat room, but still, where I was asked about my faith and I actually gave some testimony and I had some uh, Calvinist uh, uh, literally start jeering and japing and saying, this is pathetic, this is disgusting, this is so bad, and interrupting me while I'm trying to give my testimony. And it was, you know, I had not encountered something like that even from atheists, you know. Um, yeah. And I think it's important because some Christians aren't hostile, they just don't know and don't understand. And, and, and I think for those who are at least not hostile and open to it, it's useful to know why we think these things. And it's, I think it's also useful that for them to know that if you took every Catholic off the planet, like they all plunged into hell tonight for being pagan idol worshipers or whatever, and we're just gone from the Pope on down, every Catholic vanishes. Um, the majority of the Christians still walking around this planet would love Mary the Queen, the ever virgin blessed Mary the Queen of Heaven, you'd still have the absolute majority of Christians would love the ever blessed virgin Mary the Queen of Heaven. Um, and I've tried pointing that out to some of them, and it's like a, a stone, you know, it's like talking to a wall. Uh, they'll just say, it doesn't matter, you know, majority opinion doesn't make you right, which is not a real good answer, by the way. Um, it doesn't make you wrong either. It doesn't make you wrong. In fact, majority opinion is, you know, just in terms of uh, uh, common sense, majority opinion is going to be right on most things on everyday sure. life. It you just is. Sure. If it was not so, we would be in constant chaos. 
And not only that, if the opinion has been carried out from generation to generation, that at least means it's had the it's had the vote of every generation that decided to pass it on to their sons. So if an idea has been preserved faithfully for two thousand plus years, that at least means uh, you know uh, four hundred or five hundred generations of thoughtful men have thought about it and thought it was worth passing on. So before you dismiss their their idea uh, treat it with a little respect. Like you say, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right because it's in the majority. It doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong because it's in the majority, but it does necessarily mean that it's not just a Roman Catholic innovation because right. look at all the other people who have the same uh, doctrine and the same uh, customs. Yes. Same or, 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 or nearly the same. If you this was this was one of the things that convinced me because I had a I grew up I grew up Bible Christian. I grew up with a King James Bible on my dad's side and my stepdad's side it was mainline Calvinist Presbyterianism um, of a sort that was moderately liberal in the 70s which is to say would still be considered conservative today um, by a lot of people and and it, here, here's kind of where it stems from. We, you cannot find the role of the Queen of Heaven explicitly spelled out in the scriptures. You have to dig deep. And I genuinely believe that people who believe the scriptures alone are sufficient and will explain themselves to us if we, you know, the Holy Spirit will guide us to write, read it right. That's that's a Protestant theology. Um, yeah. They don't, and they don't all hold to it. It's, it's a specific strain of Protestant theology. If they can't find it, they think it's not true. There's several things that are wrong with that reasoning. But I, but to me, really, it was mute proof. Like the scriptures said that um, the Holy Spirit would stay with us and prevent us from falling into error. Right. It, and 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 Jesus did promise that that would happen. Now that doesn't mean no one would fall into error. And of course, there's many warnings about the church falling into apostasy in the in the last days. But at, at some level, no. When you have two thousand years of uninterrupted tradition on something, that's a sign that the Holy Spirit has allowed it to happen. And so you ought to at least be open on it, unless you're just going to declare that all the Christians who believe this. All the non-Catholic Christians who believe this stuff are also all pagan idol worshippers going to go to hell and are stupid. You have to consider the possibility that the Holy Spirit allowed this belief in the Blessed Mother to go on because it's true. Also, the argument that just because it's not in the Bible, it's therefore not Christian, uh, that doesn't hold up under scrutiny because monogamy is not in the Bible. The Trinity is not in the Bible. The Bible hints that Jesus is God but doesn't say it clearly enough to make Arianism ridiculous. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Most of, most of the mainstream Protestant beliefs are in the tradition of the church and not in the Bible itself, not written down in black and white in the King James Bible. Also, the King James Bible removes certain books, such as Maccabees, where people are praying for the dead. So the, so the, so the, the, so the book was edited to conform to a certain ideology, uh, and was not being passed down faithfully from its original. So, so using that book to say, if it's not here, therefore it's not Christian, doesn't work. Even a, even a hardcore Protestant should say at least the book contains everything necessary for salvation without saying, therefore, if not in the book, not true. That's, a, that's, that's the way a Muslim would approach things. That's, that's a Muslim Quran idea. That's, yeah. not a, that's not a Christian biblical idea. No, it's actually not. In fact, the Bible makes reference to a number of things that aren't in the Bible, <laughs> including whole books. The Bible references books right. that aren't in the Bible and stories that aren't in the Bible that you can and find elsewhere. Could, and if you believe the if you believe that the Bible contains the books that are supposed to be in the Bible, that means you at least believe that the church in the fifth century had the authority to pick which books went into the Bible because the fifth century is when that was decided. Yeah, but, I mean, I've seen arguments. They've got they've got lists that are well, largely the same. Just a, moment, just a moment, just a moment. But in the fourth and third century is when you get the the other traditions that they're that they're dismissing as being innovations. So if the church in the fifth century was valid and trustworthy, 
why is it suddenly the 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 belief that Mary was ever virgin, which comes from the second century, three hundred years earlier, invalid? How could the church be corrupt in the second century, pure in the fifth century, and then corrupt again in the sixth? That makes no sense. Yeah, and we can go back now, and this is I mean because I got kind of want to point something out and get to something more direct and spiritual. But what really convinced me was not studying the Eastern Orthodox or the Catholics. It was studying the Assyrian Orthodox and the the Oriental Orthodox, or the ones who looked to Alexandria, because they, they cut off, they, they split off from both Rome and Constantinople in the 400s. And it does turn out that Mary was a part of the fights, but it wasn't that anybody disputed her role as the Queen of Heaven. Nobody did. There are accounts of the Nestorians because the Nestorian of the Nestorian controversy. Um, and the only thing I can tell you in this, and I can give you numerous references, I've even talked to some people who are from the Nestorian tradition, is it's been generally agreed that the whole Nestorian controversy was a misunderstanding and that it was political. There is a slight difference in Christology, but not that not enough to be a church dividing issue. And in fact, what the Nestorians believe. There's a certain strain of uh, Bible Christian out there that will quote sources from the church that went, you know, the Assyrian, the Eastern, the Aramaic fathers, uh, but they're not getting it right because the Aramaic fathers, were they got into a fight because they did not want to call Mary mother of God. They wanted to call her a mother of Christ and between, and, or, or mother of Jesus, who is God. Uh, you will see a number of Protestant sources, especially online, claiming that this is proof that within the early church, at least in this era, there were Christians who only wanted to call her mother of Jesus. Um, they, they, they find quotes from these church fathers from the Aramaic traditions who only wanted to call him her mother of Jesus. But it turns out they are not really reading carefully because these Aramaic fathers wanted to call her mother of Jesus, who is God, or mother of Christ, i.e. Christokos. And the, the, the confusion mostly comes down to the fact that if you say mother of God in Aramaic, it sounds like mother of the father, and it's confusing. And almost everybody agrees that that, that, that whole blow up started with this one, just this misunderstanding over what, is, what, what would mother of the father mean in Aramaic. This makes no sense at all. Your, your, your formulation doesn't work. And quite a bit of the fighting that caused that schism was just over that. And they weren't understanding each other. There was politics and so on. You talk to the people in that so-called Nestorian tradition. Uh, not only do they believe in the Holy Trinity, but uh, and that God was fully human and human and divine, but that Mary is the ever virgin queen of heaven. Uh, they call her Saint Mary, but still. Um, and they pray for her intercessory prayers, and they agree that she's our mother. We, we along with Jesus. Huh? We call her St. Mary, too. I used to live in St. Mary. I know. No, well, I know, but it's more, it's, I don't know. For, Catholics don't say St. Mary as often. I just, I don't hear it as often. Because we go, we like all the other titles. Our Lady, Our Mother, Mother Mary, Blessed Mother. We use them all. But uh, Saint is proper. There's nothing wrong with St. Mary. Um, I think the other branches tend to use the other titles less. I guess that's all I'd say there. But and I, this is all important because I contend that understanding Mary is truly the path to understanding the deepest and most personal of Christian theologies. Once you have an understanding of who she is and what she is, I'm telling you right now, I really believe if an evangelical Christian just comes to appreciate Mary and is, swears I'm never going to be a Catholic, that's fine. If you, if you come to appreciate Mary better, A, your spiritual life will be enriched. And B, you'll be able to make more friends with Catholics, <laughs> just straight up by by appreciating what it's all about. Do you know what I mean, John? Um, I don't. I don't have any opinion one or the other on it. Part of the, part of the problem with me is that that I came to Catholicism from an athe uh, atheist point of view. I was a total atheist. I didn't believe in anything supernatural in any religion and any denomination. So to me, all y'all were the same. You, you everything was just as much make-believe as Norse gods or uh, classical gods or the uh, uh, the spirit beings of Tibet or what have you. Right. So that when I so that when I converted, to, to me the idea that that there was something wrong with one denomination as opposed to the other looked to me like a a, a squabble between brothers. It looked to me like a a messy divorce. The kind of things divorced people say when they're 
clutching at anything they can say to wound the other side. And it's impossible for me to believe that any Protestant sincerely thinks the Catholics who taught his grandfathers how to pray to Christ are actually pagans. And I think it's just, I think some of the rhetoric got, got inflated and got, got, uh, got hyper, uh, hyperventilated because so much anger was unleashed on both sides in the 15th and 16th century. Uh, but I have heard people say, oh no, the Virgin Mary is a pagan goddess. And the, the proof of this is that she's shown with stars on her head in some, in some pictures and so on and so forth. Uh, right. The reason why, since I was never on that side and I never was exposed to that idea as an atheist, I didn't, I, I don't have any sympathy for it. I don't have an understanding of what is cheesing them off. I do understand the argument that the command, the Ten Commandments say you can't make any graven images, so you have to have your you have to have your your cathedrals look exactly like mosques, which have no uh, you know statues in them. I mean, I, I believe that I believe that is a, a, a logical deduction that is based on a misunderstanding of what the words mean. But I understand what the argument is. If there's only one God, then there can't be a Trinity. If there's only one God, then you can't show any devotion or affection for Mary, because devotion and affection is the same as the worship you give a God. Those are all understandable arguments to me, but they're all based on merely misrepresenting what the Catholics say and what and what the what the Bible says and what the tradition says. Yeah. None of them seem to me to be none of them seem to me to be arguments that you really have to ponder deeply to see where the to see uh, uh, where the truth lies. Well, let me. They, they, they all, they all seem, they all, because because I'm because I'm a stranger to it. It all just seems accusatory to me, like you're making up an accusation that you're going to fling out at someone. Yeah, I know. All right. Let, first off, though, for the audience, uh, I think for their benefit, first, I I think what really would help the audience, at least who are foreign to this, is to understand that ultimately what we believe is that when any of the saints in heaven act, but, uh, but particularly when Mary acts, it is actually ultimately the power of the Holy Spirit going on there. And even with something like there's a Marian apparition or whatever, which, by the way, I believe those are quite real, um, that is really, she is uh, representative of the Holy Spirit more than anything else. In fact, when you get into really deep Catholic theology, which some Orthodox, some other Orthodox might uh, might they might not be sure what they thought. Let's put it to you that way. Um, but it's deep in Catholic theology that in reality, whenever the Holy Spirit acts, he does so through Mary. By choice, not by requirement. Um, because he wants to. And because it's a beautiful thing. And it, it, it actually, if you get really deep into it, 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 it gets into God's relationship with humanity at a really deep level, too. Because she doesn't do anything except what the Holy Spirit wills. She's not the Holy Spirit. She's, she just does whatever he says to do. Yeah. She's a creature. She's a created being, like we are. Yeah, but it does give a it, it does give us lowly humans a personification. And I'll tell you something. One of the things I consider mute witness to this is that an astonishing number of people I've run across from Protestant backgrounds who don't know anything at all will say, "Is the Holy Spirit a woman?" That is <laughs> such a common question. And I myself often, even when I was kind of in, in atheist days, I'm like that. What you know, I, Holy Spirit seems to have that kind of vibe thing. In it's some a natural way. thought. If you have God the Father and God the Son, and there's a third one there, who, who doesn't think of a family? Father, mother, son. Right, but the Holy Spirit is not a woman. It's not. The Holy Spirit is, is male, is masculine, the same way God Himself is. God the Father is in Jesus. And God, uh, God, okay. But he chooses uh, to allow his wife and to or his spouse, actually. And that is another we don't even, wife is a little weirder word. But we really believe that she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. OK, so she's Jesus's mom and she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, the Holy Spirit can appear in other forms. Don't get me wrong. But we believe that once she was elevated to that level of status to queen of heaven, um, that means something. Now, some Protestants will point to an obscure passage, I forget which one it's in, Elijah maybe, I can't remember, about some pagans making sacrifices to a, a pagan goddess called the Queen of Heaven. But that's been recognized for thousands of years as a, a pagan goddess of, called the Queen of Heaven that you made sacrifices to. Mary did not even exist in the physical world uh, at that time. 
Uh, and although... it's, it's a frivolous argument. It's like it's like saying that God the Father is a pagan god because his one of his titles, Sky Father, is the same title that Zeus uses. Well, that's right. In fact, you can or, find you... or Jupiter is just Latin for our Father in Heaven. It's it's a it's a the the pagans are types and shadows. The pagans are reflections of reality. The reason why so many pagans convert to Christianity is once they see the substance, they leave the shadow. But the, po the point of being a shadow is you have the same form as the substance. Just because a ball casts a circular shadow on the ground doesn't mean the ball is a shadow itself. So just because two gods have the titles in common, you know, it's 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 a silly argument based on. It's not a serious argument. Once again, it's just it's just an accusation. Well. Yeah, and and by that frame of logic, by the way, I've seen some really, really stupid, uh, disingenuous atheists point out that you know, the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh Elohim, or whatever, has appeared in you know appears to be similar named gods in other religions that aren't the same. I'm like, yeah, you think you got something deep there? No. Back when I was an atheist, I thought it was a really telling point that religions disagreed with each other. And the idea that some peoples could get one part of the truth and some peoples could get another part of the truth and that one peoples could get the real deal, the whole of it, for some reason, even though that's true in every other field of science, literature, art, and life, my atheist brain could not accept that it might be that way in religious matters, too. Yeah, some will be more right than others. Some will have parts of the truth. Right. That much should and, be obvious. But just because Einstein can explain... The procession of the axes of Mercury doesn't mean that Newton was wrong and that apples fall up. Just because one guy's right doesn't mean another guy is wrong. It just means he's less right. We believe it's that not a hard concept to grasp. Right. And we believe that when we are elevated to heaven, finally, hopefully, um, we will be beyond, you know, the the limitations of time and space and the laws of physics. And and as the queen, okay, and as the queen of heaven, you know, Mary's going to have a higher place than the rest of us because she will be the queen. Jesus is the king. And I know we've mentioned this before, but I'll just say it again. People say, where do you see evidence that Jesus had a queen? And the correct response is, what is your evidence that he wouldn't have a queen? Listen, he's the king of the Jews, he's right? The he's the son of David and the king of the Jews. Who was the queen of all the kings of the Jews? The queen of all the kings of the Jews, the queen of all the kings in the line of David was always his mother. The queen mother. And they yes. sit there and say, well, where do you see this in the Bible? Well, A, that, what I just said is they're all over the Old Testament. Look through all the Old Testament kings. If they have a queen mentioned at all, it's always his mom. Always. Uh, no exceptions. Um, all the kings in the line of David. The, the think of yourself as a first century Christian. Think of yourself as you wish as a quote unquote primitive early Christian. I'm I'm starting to not like the word primitive. Uh, but because yeah, if you read what they wrote, those guys sound like Catholics. They don't they don't talk about things like justification. They talk about things like the eternal virginity of Mary from a very early point. The, but 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 primitive. But but the but I mean the really primitive Christians, the ones who actually saw Jesus walking around. Yeah. And the ones who just had who had barely any idea what they were even witnessing, but decided to follow them. Right. Right. And barely, probably not even literate. First question out of their mouths, most of them would be, oh, he's the king. Well, what, who's his queen? It just would have been. How, how would they have not just assumed his mother must be the queen then? That would just be the instant assumption. And right. the rest of his family would instantly be, if he's God and the Messiah, the rest of his family is all going to be way important. Royal family. Just the way people will think, even if you don't think that way, the average person. I heard a guy called Catholic Redneck. I love the guy. He's a former Baptist, Catholic Redneck now. And he said he got thinking about Mary, and he said, you know what I thought? Because he has that nice southern draw. You know what I thought? I thought if I found out that... Jesus' mom was living in the house down the street from me, and she was there. I would just go over there every morning and bring her biscuits and gravy and mow her lawn and ask her if she needed anything at all. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds, no, that exactly makes the right sense, doesn't it? It's, it's, it does make sense. 
I like I say, this is all kind of alien to me because I because I the, the 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 commotion and the conflict between the Protestant and Catholic is not something I was uh, I was aware of until I converted. I mean, excuse me, I, I was aware of it. I knew it existed, but it wasn't. I wasn't on one side or the other. I had no dog in that fight. But the the Protestants I've spoken to all seem to have a, and I'm not sure if this is true of all Protestants, or if I've just merely run across a certain type, they all seem to have this, this attitude that if Christ can save you by himself, then you should not get to know any of Christ's other followers or friends or right. family members That's All I need is love Jesus. anyone he loves. And you don't, you don't need saints because everyone's a saint, and you shouldn't make any pictures of him because you have to do this without using your imagination and you don't need help praying to him and you don't need a priest because Christ can do everything just by himself and then when you get to heaven it'll be you and him just kind of the two of you alone in a big white empty expanse <laughs> now none of them actually said the words big white empty expanse but that's what it sounded like to me and I kept thinking of of once again, as an atheist, and to me this was new, this was I was not raised in, in, in one tradition or the other, uh, to me it sounded odd to think that God is almighty and doesn't need anyone. All Christians agree on that. But no. Catholics believe that God operates through intermediate causes in order to honor and bless those causes. He, he operates through people. He will, he will assign a person to go, give yes. someone a God could have told Pharaoh, God could have appeared to Pharaoh himself, surrounded by lightning bolts, and said, let my people go. He didn't do that. He got a stammerer, okay? He got a guy who was, who was bad at public speaking and said, you go tell him, okay? Now, why did he do that? Why, when, when, uh, when God is going to introduce Jesus into the world, he gets John the Baptist to baptize him. Why didn't God come down and do it himself? Why doesn't he do everything himself? The reason is that God is love, and love shares things. When a faith healer puts his hands on a person and prays to Christ and the guy is healed, the faith healer is not drawing energy out of his own body, like some sort of mutant power from the X-Men, okay? The faith healer is praying to God. God is the, the source of all action. God is the one who's doing it. But what, so why does the man have to go to the faith healer? Well, because it's, it's love. He gets to help. Yes. Can God you imagine what a blessing people. it is if if I get to help someone come to Christ, if I get to help uh, heal the sick, if I get to help spread the word? It's, it's, it's a gift to me as well as a gift to the person who's being approached. Yeah. And some people, for one reason or another, are either too intimidated or too impure or too angry or too self-absorbed to come to Christ immediately themselves on a daily basis. And Maybe going through another human being is a little easier for them. Doesn't mean you can't pray to Christ directly. Doesn't mean you can't do anything directly. God is in your heart. <laughs> okay. I, I, the Holy I Spirit to... lives in every Christian. But right. it doesn't mean you have to do it. Your rules as to how it's done doesn't doesn't bind the, the way God is going to do it. God is going to do it in the most loving way possible. And your mind and my mind are not sufficient to, to anticipate what that's going to look like. And, and there's where it gets to me. Um, I, I used to kind of instinctively agree with this. I don't need any of that. It's just me and Jesus. Or I go straight to the Father. Okay, okay. I, I, I actually can, to a large degree, uh, accept that. And that, that it's not necessarily anything wrong with it. But what I would see, we get accused, those of us who have a relationship with the saints in heaven, get accused of, of, of some, you know, getting, you know, thinking Padre Pio, or 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 any name any particular saint mother teresa anybody part of patron saint of philosophers yeah we, we can get we get accused of that and it's possible um excess marianism has gotten out of control a few times but not as often as people ask uh, think um uh, excess reverence of a certain saint it's it's, it's known to happen uh it's not very often though it's really not the church is pretty good about it plus if you just <laughs> read the lives of the saints and read how we learn about the saints. It's all about their relationship with God and the inspiration they give us to get closer to God. I've got to interrupt because you've got to give me a chance to, to make a comment about something like that. The church's role in history is usually reining back the enthusiasm of people who are getting out of, getting out of hand. If, if you look at church history, 
Yeah. It's not it's not trying to stir it up. So Yeah, exactly. Um the church is but but in any case, so these relationships with the saints in heaven, which yes, we're surrounded by a cloud of saints. We've got all kind I'm not going to I'll give the scriptural proofs again to people who want to say it. I mean, you can insist on reading the Bible differently. And that's because the Bible will admit to multiple interpretations. But the vast majority of Christians have always read it that you can Pray to the saints in heaven, and they will pray for you. Ultimately, it's God. God's not going to do anything God doesn't approve of. And the way I see it is this. There's an arrogance to saying, I'm going straight to the Jesus. Just me and Jesus. Part of There is an arrogance in it that, you know, if we're, if we're going to be chided for getting too into Mary or too into Mother, uh, Mother Teresa or too into whatever saint you want, too into Joan of Arc, whatever it is, um, the, the danger of, isn't there a certain arrogance? And, and, and like, are you really worthy? Do you, do, do, do you, I, don't know, I, I don't know if it's arrogance or not, but I do think it is a temptation to seek a simpler, purer, and right. uh, more primitive system. That's, but, that's why, for example, the Muslims don't have priests, don't have statues, don't have scripture. They've got one book, and that's it. Yeah, they they were they 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 thought that religion was too complex. I, I, I actually do yeah. think it's just Bible only Christianity is inspired by by Quranic uh, thought. I really do um, uh, by Islamic type thought because that's not how how most Christians have. Well, it's, it's also an easy answer. It's also it's all, excuse me. It sounds like an easy answer, but then when you try to put it into effect, all that happens is you get churches that then interpret the Bible differently, and they split and form two churches. And then four, and then sixteen, and then so on. And they fight constantly and split. And the one thing they unify on is bashing the Catholics. Yeah. But in any case, the the though that strain of Christianity usually tends to fizzle out because yeah, it, it just congregation after congregation splits up because it's based on the charisma of the preacher, ultimately. Yeah. Um, but to get back okay. to it, I just want to think real quick. Okay, but I, okay. Uh, but, when when you mention charismatic preachers. One of the reasons why I did not join a Protestant church, among my several reasons for not joining, was those that I was exposed to talked more about their founder than they did about Christ, or they talked at least equally. So to accuse us of placing someone ahead of Christ seems to me, at least from my point of view, rather ironic. Now maybe you haven't encountered that. Maybe it, maybe it was just maybe it just so happened to be the the particular Protestant churches I saw in action, but the ones I saw in action made so much more about uh, of their founder than they did of their god that those people yeah. can't in all honesty make that claim for, to, toward us i would agree that i've seen that definitely in action and the more the ministry is about the man the more the ministry is messed up so if you know a famous preacher and you follow a famous preacher and you spend a lot of time talking about him, that's a sign something's wrong. To be fair to our, our Lutheran, Methodist, uh, uh, traditional Presbyterian, Protestant brethren, they get that too. Charismatic Christianity has a definite downside and having it based on that. But let me get back to the point of arrogance saying, I'm just going to go to Jesus. I'm just going to go to Jesus. Okay, that's, that's, you, you, I do it all the time. So don't, don't, but at some level, if you've really grasped God in any mature way, nobody can fully grasp God, but if you've really grasped God enough, God is way too big for you to relate to. I'm sorry, at least I think most human beings, God is way too hard to relate to. It's because he's the infinite everything. He knows everything. He can do everything. He is everything to, you know, controls everything that is. All it is is there because of him. He, and he's aware of all of it at all the time. You can't grasp a, sh a shred of that. You, you could just grasp in the abstract that he's the grand intelligence running everything. That's, but you get close enough and it's like, how do you relate to something so big and vast? Well, Jesus becoming a human is a part, but even still getting to know Jesus the human, there are so many ways to look at a person that getting to know Jesus through other people's eyes is a lot of what the whole uh, getting to appreciate the lives of the saints is, is to see how other people serve Jesus. How did they view him? How did they see him? Um, they can become a link like, uh, oh, I've had a problem with alcohol. Here's this saint that had that problem with alcohol. And here's how they overcame. And here's how they prayed. And 
it gets you closer to God because you start seeing how other people see God and how other people relate to it. And sometimes they'll be wildly different. Somebody like St. Louis de Montfort was a very fiery preacher and, and full of energy. And then you had Therese Lisieux, who was so dainty and so quiet. She was a, such a little mouse that hardly anybody noticed her until after she died and they read her stuff. Oh, whoopsie there. We had a little bit of a technical glitch. What I was saying is when you when you get to know any of the saints, of which Mary is only one, although I don't say only in her case because she's the queen, but she is one of the, when you get to know any of the saints, you see this broad diversity. You have lions of the faith who roared like St. Louis de Montfort or Joan of Arc. And then you have these quiet contemplatives like St. Teresa of Lisieux or some of the other great saints who were just very gentle and never ordered anybody and were very, 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 very little people. But, you know, then you would discover their writings later or see the influence they had on either. Both are valid approaches to God and getting to know God, but seeing the different ways people get to know God enriches your understanding of God. And there's also a certain humility in saying, I don't know how to get through this. You know, St. Saint, Saint Therese helped me figure out how to fix my life, help me, you know, pray for me. And when you go to, Mo to, to Mother Mary, ultimately, you're going to your own mother, not just um, Christ's mother, because on the cross at Calvary, he gave her to us to be our mother too. This makes him our brother. This is really when you get into a, a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, realizing that he shared his mom with us. Okay, he was fully human. We've all heard this, right? He's both fully human and fully divine. This means as fully human, Jesus would have loved his mother as much as any man loved his mother. And in fact, he would love him more than any man ever loved his mother, love her more. Um, and once you get that, and once you get that this whole thing makes Christ our brother, um, and, and, and that even if you've got, everybody's got a messed up mother to some degree, everybody's got a messed up family to some degree, having a perfect one is a massive and enormous gift. And that, that's what Mary is. And in reality, I'll, I'll just say one last thing. I pray the rosary every day. And within the rosary are meditations. And I discovered this on my own, but I soon discovered I wasn't as clever as I thought because uh, it's people have been doing it from the beginning. We have these meditations, which are various Bible stories. And if you start thinking of the characters in, in each of those meditation vignettes, basically, if you watch Christ through Mary's eyes and see how everything going on there look through Mary's eyes while you're meditating upon it, you get a different picture of Jesus and you get a different, and, and suddenly you can relate to Jesus, but you can also relate to those who were around him uh, uh, as they watched him go through everything he went through, his entire ministry. Mary is a key to understanding Jesus better. So are all the saints, actually. But uh, Mary is probably the most important one. She brought him into the world and he shared her with us to be a shared mother. That's really special. And I think Protestants who are afraid of her may just have anger issues with their moms. I really do. I think that might be part behind a lot of it. They're mad at their moms, just like a lot of most atheists are mad at their dads, because that really is visibly most atheists are mad at their dads. I think the anti-Marians, even Christians who are against, who don't like Marianism at all, I think it might be a broken mother relationship. And if that's true, the only thing I'll tell you is I had a broken mother relationship too. Mary fixes that. So that's my long rant. What do you got to say there, John? I would I'd say be careful at psychoanalyzing people at a distance because no one knows the human heart correctly. True. I, I, but I do believe that you can tell how good of a uh, a wife a woman is uh, by what her attitude toward God is. If she's disobedient toward God, she's going to be disobedient to her husband. And you can tell what kind of a mom, excuse me, what kind of a dad a husband is going to be if you see what his relationship is to Mary. Because if he has contempt for Mary, he's going to have contempt for other women as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. And yeah. I see that. Not I've true, seen not, that. I'm not saying it's true 100% of the time. I'm not saying it's true 100% of the cases, but, I, but I'm saying it's a it's a tendency. I, I would agree. And having been in a lot of Protestant circles, which have a, a strong anti-Mary, anti-Saints, anti-anything Catholic streak, um, it, it, 
it's it. I hate to sound judgmental, but I'm sorry. The status of women is actually lower in such congregations, not higher. Um, and I, I think that's because Professor Rachel Fulton Brown and others are correct. Once you understand that we all have a mother in heaven and that the fairest of them all, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all, and all that fighting that goes on between women and who's going to be the queen bee, well, guess what? Mary, Mary is always the fairest one of all. And she's always the, ultimately the queen bee. And this... Really, uh, I find women who love the Blessed Mother tend to get along with each other better. This is very observable to me. And congregations which are anti-Mary, I've seen it. You can either believe me or not. But genuinely speaking, I see more politicking and fighting among the women. And I, I see a lower status for women. Like I will actually see men speak contemptuously of women. And, um, you know, they think their role, role as the head of the household means like some kind of domineering master, shut up woman kind of relationship. And that doesn't work out. I, I guess that's my rant, but it's what I've observed. And I genuinely believe as somebody who's quite devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary and has only come to love Jesus more because of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, I think any man with a good relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary will make a good husband and father. It just, well, it's hard, it's, it's, it, I'll just say it's hard to have contempt for women if you also serve a queen. You know, but, and, and then but then they'll get this weird psychology where they think, well, that means you worship women. But they're not getting it because they think, oh, you love Mary. That means you love all women because she's representative of all women. No. She's the most awesome woman ever. No woman come, no other woman comes close. I, I will just note that the the uh, status of women in classical society was inferior to that women enjoyed in the Middle Ages when when Catholicism was dominant, and also in Eastern society. To to this day, the Orientals, the Chinese, have a uh, a dearth of women because they will always abort the uh, the girl baby rather than the boy baby. Uh. No, no, no one has ever had concern for women outside of Christendom. It, it, the idea, the, the idea of female equality, is is springs out of the idea that all souls created by God are infinitely valuable, therefore equally valuable. You don't, you just don't find that elsewhere. You just don't find that in other in other societies. You don't find that in other cultures. So I'll even find Catholics, young ones, usually falling into this and saying men are superior to women, and that's just the dumbest thing you could ever say. There are certain senses you could say in some areas or, or, you know, it is usually better with men in charge. But no, men are not superior to women. As yeah, soon in charge of what? In charge of, in charge of fights? Yes. In charge of, of competitive uh, things? Yes. In charge of hierarchical things? Yes. In charge of, of, uh, in charge of building a community? No. In charge of raising the young? No. In charge of making peace? No. Uh-huh. It's like cats and dogs. Cats are good for some things and dogs are good for other things. You know, you, you can't, a cat's not going to pick slippers or, or scare and, and away a burglar, but, you know. None of this even requires the so-called rigid gender roles that everybody's so terrified of that supposedly come out of Catholic thinking. I mean, yes, we do have gender roles, but I, I can assure you throughout history, people who don't want to get married have an honorable role within the faith. Certainly. People, uh, women who actually are called to go and do things like be warriors or be philosophers, um, they get to do that, like, like, like. Uh, yeah, jo- Joan of Arc was a Catholic. Okay, break it to you. Let me break it to you, boys. That's Joan right. Was Catholic. And then there was Saint Hildegard in the uh, I can't remember. It was like the twelfth, eleventh century, somewhere, somewhere twelfth, eleventh century, something yeah. like that. Literally, the woman was a philosopher, became a saint, and became a doctor of the church. Yeah. Um, because she was so influential in her writings and, and her poetry and music, too, for that matter. Uh, but, but, but also please notice that the Catholics are criticized both for making too much of women, because we revere and reverence Mary above all of the saints, and for making too little of women, because we believe the sexual roles are, are uh, ordained by God and everyone has a, a place in God's plan. Right. And, and those, either one. Both, both of those things can't be true. It's got to be one or the other. So take your, I mean, take your pick. We're the ones who think that it is a man's job to love his woman. Right. And he's failing if he's not doing that. 
Uh, you know, at the same time, uh, women, well, they can be, <laughs> I don't want to get too far out of what independence is, but I think one of the things our whole society is beginning to discover is that one thing won't, one women, most women don't want is independence. Um, in fact, if you really think about it, most people, yeah. we total okay. independence. Let me give you another word for independence, loneliness. Yeah. Uh, there, are people, there are people in hospitals these days who don't have any relatives to come visit them because... People don't get married these days anymore. They have kids, but all the kids are bastards. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me. I don't mean they they are people of ill intent. I mean they're illegitimate. They're born out of wedlock, and they don't have much by way of cousins and and grandparents if, if there's no family structure. Yep, happens a lot. Yep, absolutely. And, and what long term firm friendships do you form in a in a society like that? Right. And so the point is, is that this classical Christian thinking is that men and women are both equally valuable and equally loved by God, period. Right. And, and so they're different and things will get weird and disordered if you try to, you know, they're always going to be the guy who, you know. And vivo oh, the difference. <laughs> yes. There's always going to be the husband out there who he's so afraid of bugs, he lets his wife squish them. Um, you know, or or the wife who actually enjoys mowing the lawn. That these things aren't against the law. Um, no. it's, it's but we are we are allowed to make jokes about them though, because humor is also one of God's gifts. That's right. That's right. So, but I, I honestly think, listen, Christians, we believe that when when ultimately when we say Mary's done something, or that we've prayed to Mary, or that Mary has delivered us a miracle, um, which by the way has happened to me, that's ultimately from the Holy Spirit, and it's ultimately from God. Mary's got no power on her own, yeah. um, and, and that's true for our interactions with any of the saints. But I've said it before, and I'll say it again: if you understand the uh, who Mary is and her relationship to God, you also even understand the Holy Trinity better. I don't know how. People with no understand, no good understanding of Mary even grasp the Trinity. I mean, I know everybody agrees it's inherently ungraspable. But let me say it again, as I've said so many times: Mary is the daughter of the Father, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, and the mother of the Son. And God loves her equally and infinitely as a daughter, a wife, a spouse, and and a mother. And He loves her infinitely in all those capacities. Now, if you love her. Who's the love ultimately going to? Him. He made her. And he shared her with us. This is also how you get your personal relationship with Jesus. This is maybe one where Catholics fall down sometimes and we don't get spiritual enough because we're so logical all the time. We don't, you know, get into it. But personal relationship with Jesus, he's my brother. Yeah, and if you have a personal relationship with your best friend and he invites you over to his house, are you going to snub his mom when she answers the door? Just That's right. And offer you say, hey, you're not my friend. He's my friend. You're not my friend. That's right. I, my friendship is only for him. I don't need anyone else. Is that <laughs> Who the, the hell are you, works? lady? <laughs> is, that, is that the way love works? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's a holy family. It honestly is because St. Joseph is the foster father of Jesus. Yep. In modern terms, you could relate to him like a stepfather figure. Um, and legally, he's the foster father. Hey, I... I have an adopted daughter. Uh, I uh, no, no one is going to mock foster fatherhood in my hearing. It is oh, it, is, it is a deep and abiding relationship. So you know Saint Joseph, all honor to him. He's, yeah, I, I wasn't he, aware. He of that. Is the, he's the patron saint of the good death because he died with Jesus to one side of him and uh, Holy Mary to the other side of him. Yeah, I mean he he didn't have the easiest life, but on the other hand, he got to live with Jesus and Mary. Really, that was probably a pretty cool life. Um, so. What I'm going to say to other Christians is try to at least open yourself up to this. Try to be open-minded. Try not to be angry. And try not to just sit there yelling that you don't see it in the Bible. A lot of things in the Bible, if you're a serious Christian, you know, require deep study and meditation and understanding. This is one of those topics. The vast majority of Christians have always believed Mary is the Queen of Heaven, and giving her honor and asking her to pray for us goes back to the earliest days. So you can either be like a Mormon or some of the other radicals and say that there was a great apostasy, you know, 14, 1800 years ago or whatever, and now you're going to restore the true church. Most Christians believe all this stuff we're talking about. And even the ones who split off from the evil Catholics more than a th more than 1,400 years ago.
Yep. So that's all I would say. Did you have any closing thought first, John? I would say uh, a study of early heresies is very instructive because one of them is called Coleridianism, and the, and the Roman Catholic Church has officially denounced it as a heresy, and that is there was a group of people who used to actually worship Mary, and they would offer her little cakes called Coleridies as part of the worship ceremony. And the Catholic Church said, no, if you do that, you are excommunicated. So someone has to explain to me how... If we are worshiping Mary, we are doing it without our own awareness or consent, and, in, and, and, and as part of an official institution that officially condemns the practice. You know, when I say worship, I don't mean give it honor to. I mean worship like a goddess. And right. I'd like someone else to explain to me if if we think she's a goddess secretly on the sly, how come the prayer I pray fifty times a day says pray for me, Mary? I don't say pray for me to, to the, the pagans don't say pray for me to Hera. Hera, pray for me to Zeus so that he will grant me the blessing of a good marriage. No, when you pray to Hera, to the goddess, you pray to her. Yeah, they don't. They don't. They don't say I. I, I pray to uh, Vishnu. Vishnu, please pray to the Brahma for right. me. No, pray for me now and at the hour of our death. That's what we say. That's right. And we mention Jesus every time we say that prayer. Every time, because she's nothing like Jesus. like you, like me, like the whole world. She is nothing without Jesus. That's right. But she brings us to Jesus and brings us closer to him, both in understanding. And frankly, if you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, you will be opening yourself up to our mother. Well, uh, even, our, even our most hard-headed uh, uh, Calvinist brethren have to agree that this woman carried God in her womb. Christ is God. He's and perfect un holiness. Unlike and almost. She carried, she carried perfection inside her body for nine months. That's right. not an ordinary woman can't do that. Moses could not even look at God's face without being destroyed. He could only look at his backside. She nursed him and looked him right in the eye. Right. Yes. Right. Um, it, 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 and it becomes important because of the relationship. By sharing his mother with us, right. he made us part of his family. That's why Christians believe, by the way, in the universal brotherhood of Christians. Right. All right, so that's, this has been fun. Tomorrow night we're probably going to have a stream with, actually we're going to be doing our Freedom from Atheism Foundation stream tomorrow night where we're helping them raise money and make, making people aware of the Freedom from Atheism Foundation. Friday we're probably going to have Misha pop off on, he, on here and we're going to talk about proven conspiracy theories from the CIA, which are all true because you can go look at it on the CIA website. So that's going to be a fun show. We are still going pretty much every night. So if you like what you're seeing here, please visit us on redpillreligion.com. Please find us on BitChute. Find us on Libri. We're still developing that one. If we're still on YouTube, give us a like and a subscribe. Please visit sci-fi-right.com. And God bless everybody. <laughs>